Okay, so thank you for the introduction, Elena. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to present some uh, new techniques and results we get during the last, I don't know, two years, something like that, with uh, Paul Kirchner and Pierre Alain Foucault. And every, every of these techniques aim at having a fast, efficient, uh, and maybe one day provable way of reducing module lattices or so-called algebraic lattices. Okay, so uh, first of all, a bit of context, and I will start this presentation by uh, going back to the roots and uh, redefining every uh, basic object we're manipulating. So lattices and then the, uh, let's say, uh, well-known, uh, most well-known reduction algorithm, which is uh, LLL. Okay, so what is this uh, all about? So suppose that we are in the Euclidean plane R2, and we take uh, two linearly independent vectors uh, in this plane, we are considering the set of integral linear combination of points uh, spanned by these two vectors, and we get a uh, very structured set of points in the in the space, uh, which we call a lattice. So it has uh, both an algebraic structure and a metric structure. The algebraic structure is uh, the fact that it's a subgroup of the Euclidean space. So why that? Because you can readily uh, subtract and add vectors and remain in the structure. And why it's uh, why the metric part is because it's a discrete set of the uh, space, so that you don't have two points which are arbitrary uh, close to one another. Okay. And then you have a natural way of encompassing the density of the lattice, let's say. Um, and this notion is uh, the covolume or volume of the lattice, which is given by uh, the volume of the fundamental parapipedis, which is generated by the basis, by a basis in particular. So then you could say, okay, but if I give you another basis of the lattice, uh, then the shape of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, parapipedis is changing so that maybe the volume is changing. In fact, it's independent of the basis. And so this, intri this intrinsic, intrinsic invariant of the lattice uh, is give you uh, a first question then. If I take my large basis here, how can I retrieve the first one, the nice, uh, short, and orthogonal one? Uh, maybe your first, uh, first idea is to use the uh, longest vector of the two here, to, the shortest vector of the two to reduce the longest one here. So what do I do? I draw the line which is spanned by uh, the short vector and get through the second one, and I will take the smallest element in the coset, which is just here. Okay, I have a new basis, which is somehow better. And then I just repeat the process. So I draw the line, and I take the smallest element in the coset, and I retrieve my initial basis. Okay, so if you want to uh, write an actual algorithm from this uh, simple uh, process, you need to uh, find like formulas for what I did, and this is, can be readily computed from the orthogonal projection. So if I take my uh, short vector to be W, my long vector to be V, I orthogonally project V over the uh, line spanned by W, I round it so that I can stay in a lattice, because as I said, uh, the only point which can reach are the point with integral linear combination of the basis. So after rounding, I subtract and I get uh, a new vector which is smaller than the initial one. So if you write that down as pseudocode, basically you retrieve the uh, so-called uh, Gauss-Lagrange reduction, uh, and which is just here. So this is like this, uh, uh, find the smallest element in the coset part, and this is the uh, continue as long as something is happening. So if you look at the properties of uh, the output basis uh, from this algorithm, you can prove by just looking at uh, the guard here that the um, first vector is necessarily smaller than the second one and that you, you have a condition on the inner product of the two vectors. This is just the fact that this quantity should be zero if you are doing nothing. Okay. From that, you can prove that U is a, short, a shortest vector of the wall lattice, so a vector with the smallest norm among all possible norms. And from that, you can also prove uh, that the norm of the first vector u uh, is smaller than a constant of your four third uh, multiplied by the covolume. Okay. So this is for dimension two. Uh, in, more, in a more general setting, in arbitrary dimension, you still have this uh, same kind of theorem here, uh, which is a Minkowski theorem for the first minima, which has said that if I take a lattice of rang D, basically I can find a vector uh, which is uh, roughly of the uh, size of the resize covolume. So 
So here it's uh, our power one over D for homogeneity reason. And there is kind of a small constant here in dimension two, it's four, th four third, and in uh, higher third dimension, can prove it's quadruple. can be even smaller than that. Okay. So, I know from Minkowski theorem that a short vector necessarily exists. Okay. Problem is that from a computational point of view, it's hard. So it's not really interesting if you want to play with this vector, actually. Uh, hopefully, in 82, Lenstra, Lenstra, and Lovac uh, address this question and prove that there exists a polynomial tile algorithm that will retrieve a small vector in any Euclidean lattice, but you can't find in polynomial time the shortest one. You will find the shortest one up to approximation factor, and the, up, the error you are making on it is something exponential in the dimension. So before explaining how you can uh, retrieve this result and try to, to generalize it, uh, let's just speak about some funny application of, of this theorem. Uh, first one is the so-called simultaneous Diophantine approximation, which is a generalization, generalization of the uh, Diophantine approximation problem. I give you a bunch of real ri, uh, and I will ask you to find a bunch of pi and one unit q such that the uh, ri are approximated well by the pi over q. So this is kind of the general problem. I mean, in, in dimension one, sorry, this problem uh, can be can be solved by uh, continuous fraction expansion, but you can't do that multiple times because the Q would not be the same. But you can solve that with LRI. Uh, a bit in the same idea, you can find minimal polynomials of some algebraic numbers. Instead of uh, having a bunch of random array here, you can just take the power of an algebraic number and then using basically a dual lattice uh, of the one here, you will be able to retrieve a polynomial that vanishes at R. From that, you can uh, do polynomial factorization over the rationals. Uh, and most, maybe most importantly for this workshop, uh, you can do a lot of cryptanalytical work uh, using LLS. So you can solve knapsack problem in certain regime. You can solve every same subject for some public exponent. And of course, uh, when some crypto system are based on lattices as a base core object, uh, you will attack these uh, problems using lattice reduction. So usually in these kind of schemes, uh, the uh, secret key is kind of a short vector or, or something related to a short vector in a lattice. So finding a short vector will help you to break the scheme. And last but not least, uh, the LLL is a, LL algorithm is also used uh, in many, uh, many algebraic number theory, um, algorithmic number theory uh, algorithm. Uh, because you can use it to control the size of uh, elements during computation. You avoid blow-ups in, uh, in the size of what you are computing. It can also be used to compute some normal forms, and it's very useful for some ideals computation. So it's a very basic building tool of, algebra of, of algorithmic number theory. Okay, so now a bit of uh, the ideas that lead to this algorithm. So if you take a, a lattice of rank D, then you take a basis of this lattice, let's say V1, Vd, and this uh, basis is yielding a filtration of the lattice. So what it is, is you start from the uh, zero vector, then you consider the uh, one-dimensional sub-lattice which is spanned by V1, the first vector of the basis, then you do the same, L lambda two will be uh, the sub-lattice of rank two spanned by the first two vectors, and so on, and you get an increasing chain of sub-lattice starting from zero to the wall lattice. Okay, why is it useful? What you can do is to uh, give a bit of quantification on how good this basis is from, uh, from the idea of, of the covolume I introduced a bit earlier. And what you do is you take the filtration at, for each point, each uh, sublattice of the filtration, you consider the logarithm of the covolume of this uh, sublattice. So basically what you, go, what, you, what you obtain is a vector of real, which is in, encoding somehow the relative densities of the sublattices of the filtration. Okay, this is just a way of having a, a bit of grip on this uh, filtration. Okay. And then if you want to act on this filtration, the only thing we knew from uh, what I explained before is the Gauss algorithm for reducing wrong two lattices. So what we are going to try is to act on the filtration uh, using the Gauss algorithm. And what we can do is, for instance, at index A, uh, we can orthogonally project or equivalently take the quotient of uh, this sublattice here by what is before him. We'll get a quotient of rank two, and this rank two sublattice can be reduced using Gauss algorithm. So we apply it. Then since we are working in a quotient or in a projection, we need just to leave the vector, but we can do that. Uh, and we replace the uh, newly found vector in the basis. And so what is happening, of course, we acted on locally on the, prof on the profile here. So we changed 
the uh, value of the degree in one point. And what is interesting is that the, degree, the new degree is smaller than the older one. So all in all, we used this Gauss reduction as a local tool over the filtration to densify it. OK, so now we have this nice little tool that acts pointwise on our filtration. So if we want to go from local to global, we need to have a strategy to, uh, or to have an order of use of this Gauss algorithm to fully reduce the basis. And maybe the simplest one is to start from the beginning of the basis here and then start reducing. So I reduce here the first two vectors and I will get a short vector. Okay, then what do I do? I just shift things and I will reduce the projection of the second and third vector. Okay, so I have a newly found a new vector here and I can continue like that. But maybe at one point the, the new vector I found could interact with what, with what is before, could be used for decreasing the profile space. So I just go back from one step and reuse it. Okay, and then I will go up again, 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 and maybe there is some new vector newly found that will be used to uh, perform a reduction of from what is before, and I just go back. Okay, and then I will go up, and eventually we can prove that I will reach the end of the basis. Okay, this is nothing more than the LLL algorithm. Um, so. More precisely, if we speak in algorithmic term, what were the main tools uh, we used to perform this global reduction? So one of them is the QR decomposition, which I said that if I take an invertible matrix, uh, I can uh, write it as a product of uh, an orthogonal part and an upper triangular one. And why is it related to this filtration uh, thing? Because uh, from uh, linear algebra, the uh, encompassing a filtration, encompassing a flag, uh, is just nothing more than taking a triangular matrix. So having this QR decomposition is how to make a link between this abstract object, which is a filtration, and the, uh, let's say, uh, practical object, which is a matrix. So working on this air part is nothing more than uh, working on the filtration, or equivalently, it's uh, like working on the grab string vectors. And another tool we used, uh, without saying it, is this uh, size reduction, which is uh, kind of um, uh, a discretized process which mimics uh, the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization of, uh, of a bunch of vectors. And this size reduction is very important as it controls the size of its coefficients and it avoids blow-ups and it uh, helps to have a polynomial reduction. Okay. Uh, a bit of uh, complexity now. If uh, we look at the original analysis of Lenschwal and Sreinovac, you can prove that uh, this LLL algorithm uh, is uh, running in a big O of something into the power of six in the dimension and something uh, cubic in the uh, bit size. Okay? Uh, if you then, uh, you, you are compute, if you are computing exactly, and this is what is done here, uh, you are manipulating a lot of uh, fractions and numerator denominators are, increasi are, going, are increasingly fast uh, growing. And then you could think to use floating points representation to uh, gain speed ups in this computation of internal values. And a milestone in that direction was reached by NPN and Steele in 2009. Uh, where they proved that uh, you can reach uh, no, um, you can reach uh, quasi-linear bound in the uh, bit size. Then uh, Neumeyer Stele uh, more recently proved that uh, you can you can use a recursive strategy on the rank to uh, reduce the uh, dimension uh, to reduce the um, sorry the complexity in something which is quasi-quartic in the dimension and which is still quasi-linear in the bit size. Okay. Let's remind us of that, which is kind of the state of the art for LLL complexities. Okay, so this was for LLL and, uh, and from Euclidean lattices. So now a bit of algebra, because like to talk is speaking about algebra, and uh, let's see uh, how we can generalize this uh, Euclidean lattices to a more exotic context. So uh, let's take a number field, uh, which is a finite field extension of the field of rational Q. We, it can be realized as a polynomial quotient, so Q of X over the ideal generated by some P, okay? In this field, you have a very uh, neat uh, and interesting uh, ring, which is a ring of integers. It's a set of uh, field elements, uh, which are annihilated by some monic polynomial with coefficient in Z, okay? It's a bit abstract, but I claim that this is a generalization of the usual integers. In the following sense, if you compute the ring of integers of uh, the field Q itself, then you will retrieve Z. 
because you just, if you take like an element, uh, let's say alpha in Z, you consider the polynomial X minus alpha and it's of course with coefficients in Z and it's monic and it's uh, make your element alpha vanishing. A bit more uh, generally, if you, ta if you take the uh, I root and you adjunct it to Q, then you will, uh, you will compute the ring of integer of this quadratic extension, which is your phi, the uh, ring of uh, the Gaussian integer. And you do the same with J, it should be a J here, sorry. You will, uh, so uh, the third root of, uh, the, sorry, the, root, the uh, primitive third root of unity, then you will find the so-called Eisenstein integers. So how is this related to lattices actually? So I said that the Euclidean lattice was a discrete subgroup of the Euclidean space. This was the definition I used. In fact, you can rewrite that in a more, let's say, algebraic way and think that an Euclidean lattice is a free Z module of finite rank with something which encompasses a metric, which is a, a quadratic form on the ambient space. Okay. So if you represent that in a um, matrix way, it's nothing more than taking a basis uh, and the basic if the basis element can be written uh, with integral elements. Okay, so like a free Z module is nothing more like something which looks like a vector space but with a base field, so base ring Z. So I'm avoiding some technicalities here. And now you could say, okay, but you just said that uh, there is a generalization of the ring of integers, which is a, of the usual integer, which is a ring of integer of a number field. So let's just plug this generalization in our definition of a lattice, and we will just replace the free Z module by a free ring of integer of, of something module of finite rank handled with something which is encompasses the metric. And from a matrix point of view, we just replace bases represented by matrices with Z coefficient by matrices with coefficient in OL, just element of the field. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, what is this inner product on this crazy space? In fact, we have a natural way of uh, giving a uh, Nermitian structure on this kind of object, and we do it by uh, looking at the embeddings of your field into the complex numbers. You have uh, the degree of the field number of them, and you can just stack them, like big vectors. Uh, this will embed all your field in uh, a product of R to the certain power, C to the certain power, which is an Hermitian space. You have a nice metric on that, so you can pull back the metric here. And so if you write the formula, you will get something very uh, readable. Okay, so maybe just let's forget about that. It's just to show you that you, yeah. Uh, just a question, in the definition of lattices, yeah. uh, of algebraic lattice, the tensor product is an OL yeah. subscript. So that implies that R has an OL action on it? Yeah, it's not, in fact, it's not a big deal because like you can always see, uh, you can always, uh, OL is always uh, a full rank Z module. So there is no problem of that. And since you can use the embedding, you can directly write the action as you want into R. Because here, like you have this, uh, I said the embedding in, embedding in R product C of the embeddings, and you can just split them into a real part and imaginary part. So you have an, a real action somehow by uh, increasing the dimension. So you just fix one. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, oh, just, uh, just a quick example. So now that we have the, the metric structure, we can just represent the example I just gave you earlier. So for the Gaussian integers, if you write down the, uh, the um, inner product, you see that one and i should be orthogonal. So you can represent the uh, Gaussian integer as a square uh, lattice. And for the Eisenstein integer, it's, uh, you retrieve actually the, orthog the um, uh, hexagonal lattice. So this is like two very simple examples actually of um, diamond of rank one uh, algebraic lattices. Rank one over the field, but rank two over the integers. But this has, has no real embeddings. So, <coughs> what? <coughs> I guess I'm confused what the OL module structure on R is. If o OL is it. I mean, what you do is basically you just use the embedding and then uh, you complete, since you are your embed, you take your embedding and then you complete with R. I mean, since one, 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 when one is fixed, then basically uh, the structure is can be just written down. I mean, I, I, just, I can show you by just the writing at the end if you want. And it's just, just like pure uh, pushing of, of, the, of the, I mean, um, just writing that. But that's not a tensor over OL, it's a tensor over Z. Yeah, I, that's I my agree question. that the tensoring over OL should be with R to the R times C to the C. Sorry, what? Uh, on the right side, the tensor product over OL should be uh, tensoring with R to the R times C to the C. That it makes sense. Yeah, okay, yeah. 
that's fine. Okay, thank you. But yeah, that would be a perfect system. Um, so, yeah, a bit of how can we reduce these objects? Since now we have a natural uh, Hermitian structure on this algebraic object, the question is how we do we reduce, uh, reduce that? Okay, a bit of like a fan of what we are going to uh, explain here. It's a bit of an impressionistic view of everything, not going into the details. So, um, okay, first of all, the basic idea encompassed by LLL was to reduce uh, the uh, search for an, an approx SVP element to an approx SVP in dimension two. So we are going to do exactly the same here, but for module SVP. And we are so uh, using the QR decomposition once again, because this is what we are using for um, Euclid and lattices. Okay. But the problem is that if we just stop there, we need an oracle to solve these rank two, small rank two instances of uh, module SVP. So this is kind of not satisfactory if we want to implement the algorithm, not in exponential time. Um, I will address this question just after. Parallel to that, we are going to uh, show that we can use as a, a recursive structure on the rank to uh, have a parallel version of the LL algorithm and of the reduction and will help to control the precision. So all of this will give you a very fast LLL type algorithm and from that we will be able to address uh, this question of the oracle. And we address it by using uh, recursivity over the base field. So uh, if, we are, if we are taking a an algebraic lattice over an upper field, and we have a subfield somewhere here, what we will do is once I have to reduce my small rank two lattices, I will just descend this lattice over a subfield and recurse over it. So all of this will uh, need to be very carefully controlled. It needs, if I descend at one point, I will need to lift another point, and this is a tricky part, I will explain that. And uh, I will also um, show you that you can leverage some specific elements of the field, which are called the units, to um, uh, to help uh, reduce the uh, precision and therefore the uh, global complexity. And last but not least, uh, we'll try to leverage something even more interesting from a mathematical point of view, which is a natural symplectic structure on the upper field. And from that, we will see that we can have a symplectic geometry which is compatible with a subfield descent. And uh, we will try to uh, beat the number of swaps which are given by the usual an analysis of LLL. Okay. This is a scary word. I should have the weak, weak thing of uh, Leo, but uh, don't worry. You'll see that it's pretty, actually pretty, pretty simple. And from that, we can have very neat application, and we implemented all of these algorithms. So we can break some FHE over the integer. We can, save, we can break some knapsack problems. We can design a faster gain tree law uh, implementation, and we can also break some overstretch and through uh, lattices. So these are the applications. Okay, so now I'm going to get a bit into the details of these uh, funds. So about this fast reduction over Z, the idea is that we can use recursion over the rank to parallelize everything. Okay, so uh, of course, uh, we are still working with the uh, QR decomposition uh, of, the, of, the, of the matrix, so everything doesn't change per, with regard to LLL. But we are not going to do this back and forth sequences of small rank to reduction. What we are going to do instead is to uh, parallelly reduce these rank two sub lattices, but at the same time. And we are not, we are not taking overlapping sub lattices, but just the one which are neighbors. Okay, this, do, this is the first step of reduction. But now you might say, okay, but what about these two vectors here and here? They are not going to, be, to act on themselves. What we do then is just to shift the uh, way we're reducing them and we're reducing all the crossed neighbors. And then we're doing it, uh, it again and again. From that, we're still reducing locally the lattice by sequences of rank two reduction, but we're doing that in a parallel way. Okay. Now, actually, uh, yeah. So this, this, this is not new. It has been, uh, it can be found in a paper of Villar in 91 and then by Zhu in 93. Uh, then maybe subsequently in other paper, but I think the two first one were these ones. Um, so uh, this is for the only. And the funny thing is that if you apply a round of this local reduction on, you can look at what is happening on the profile space. So previously I said the Gauss reduction was just acting locally on one point of the profile space and decreasing it, okay? Now since we're acting everywhere, we are 
doing something on the full profile space. And what we do is just to actually average each value at one iteration. And this is very reminiscent of a very famous equation of, uh, in physics, which is the heat equation. Because what we're doing is at each, each uh, increment of time, we are averaging the values over the whole space. So this is applying a Laplacian operator at each step. So here is, for instance, the solution of uh, the heat equation when you are starting from a Neviside distribution. So okay, this looks like that. And what is interesting is that the characteristic, characteristic evolution time of this kind of equation is quadratic. And here, in the discrete case, we still have the same. We still are um, looking at a, an, evol an evolution, a process, which, is, which will have a characteristic time, which is quadratic in the diameter of the space. The diameter of the space is nothing more than the size the number of elements in my space, which is D. So we are hoping somehow to have something which looks like um, a D square number of iteration. OK. So this is the first thing. But actually, if you look more closely at what is happening, you can see that in all of these reductions, every, every operation is local. These guys here are not going to interact with these guys here because they are far away. So we can remark that now it's possible to recurse on blocks instead of directly doing small steps of reduction. And so we are taking a small number of big blocks, let's say four here, then we are splitting our basis in four big blocks and we are recursing exactly in the same way in these big blocks. So first block here, we're going to reduce using the same techniques as before in that block. Similarly, we are going to reduce using here, here, here. And then we do exactly the same as before. We are using the shifted blocks. So we only have three now and we are recursing inside all of these blocks. Okay, and we are doing that again and again until uh, nothing more happens. So now if you redo the analysis with this kind of heat equation, you are not quadratic in the diameter of the space, but you are quadratic in the number of blocks. And since the number of blocks is a small constant, you, are, you have a number of rounds, which is now a big constant and no more something which is quadratic in this. Okay, so now if you just uh, look at a, uh, an actual, this is from the actual implementation, this is a Gram-Schmidt vectors, which is in fact, uh, very related to this uh, profile space. Uh, this is like what is happening. So we started from, maybe I will restart it. Started from reducing, reducing the central part recursively here, then we're reducing recursive, recursively, recursively. And at one point we'll start acting on the tails here. Maybe just a bit more time and here. So this is exactly this, this uh, evolution, uh, but doing in a recursive manner. And now if you look at what is going on on the uh, reduction from a complexity point of view, you can prove that for well-conditioned matrices, you can heuristically uh, find a vector within the LLL bounds in something which is, uh, let's say, D omega B, which is roughly a constant number of uh, matrix multiplications. This is heuristic. There is are some heuristic to uh, hold to have a grip on which precision is actually needed at each step of the recursion, and we are not able to find a like real proof of them, we needed this heuristic. But whatsoever the uh, estimated complexity looks like that and it's uh, coherent with the experiments. So this was for the improvement of the LLL algorithm. Yeah. No, it's uh, related to the, uh, it's related to the kappa, to the, uh, uh, to the stuff. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I have this, yeah, I have this uh, condition on the, on the condition number. Stating it like this is a bit misleading. So I just wanted that. Yeah, no, I'm, I kind of agree with you. So um, now go back on uh, the algebraic part. Uh, and so, as I said, we're going to use exactly the same idea as over Z, but here we're going to exploit algebraic specificities of the field to uh, be able to pursue our reduction. So we're still working on this uh, QR decomposition. Everything is working fine. Uh, Alice told us uh, the other day, like the formulas are exactly the same. The reduction can still be done with this parallel structure. It's just, it's just an abstract way of reducing, so it's the same. Now, what about the size reduction? Over the wheels, basically, the size reduction requires to do integral rounding because I said it's a discretization of the grand schmidt orthogonalization. At one point, you have a rounding, so you have to round over the integers. It's nothing more than a CVP instance in dimension one. Uh, if you translate that over a number field, basically what you need is to find the closest element in the ring of integers. So it's also an instance of CVP, but if your base ring is very large, then you have a very large instance of CVP. 
And then you're like, okay, I'm stuck. Actually, you don't need to do an exact CVP here, but you can just do an approx CVP. So just find something which is somewhat close, not the closest. And actually something very dumb surfaces for the approximation factor we are reaching is just that uh, we were doing the coefficient was rounding because I told you, you can represent your number field as modular polynomials. And so you take your polynomial and round each coefficient. So this is very dumb, this is very bad, but this is plenty sufficient in our case. So let's say we're done with the size reduction with that. Actually, there is a small hack here. Uh, we need to use the units of the number field to decrease uh, the condition number of, uh, the, uh, of the matrix everywhere uh, so that we can lower the precision and uh, maintain well-conditioned matrices. So I'm not going to enter that. It's like a necessary hack, but. So uh, the general strategy is now here. You take a tower of number field, you take a module over the number field, so which looks like that, okay? Then you are applying your reduction from like, you, you want to uh, apply the reduction. The algorithm is asking you now to reduce some projected wrong to some modules, so okay? So now I have to reduce that. Now I'm stuck. I should use like an oracle which is solving this reduction problem over this instance. But what I can do is I can descend this module over the subfield. So I get a, a new module, which is exactly the same, but viewed over some sum field. So this, its rank increased, and it increased by the factor which is equal to the relative decree between the two. And I have a new instance of reduction in high rank. So I can do the same, and I can recursively call the wall algorithm. And now this algorithm is telling me, please reduce me this kind of sublattices. I'm like, okay, but I still don't know how to do it. So what I can do is to descend again over some sum field and do the same and the same. And at one point, I will descend in the number field and I don't have an arbitrary, I don't have an infinite number of subfields. So at one point, I will, I will go to the end of the tower. And the end of the tower is uh, basically reducing lattices over Z. And I can do that. And then I will have to reduce some wrong two projected modules over Z, which are just wrong two Euclidean lattices. And I can do that using Gauss algorithm or if you want to be faster using Schoenegger's algorithm. And so you will find some short vectors. You can use the short vector to find the reduced basis. And then you can plug everything back, do some whatever things, find a short vector of this that is here, lift it up, find a short vector, lift everything, find short basis, and go back in the tower from the exact same place where you were descending. So you descend and then you lift everything. And this is the global strategy of reduction, recursive over the rank, over the, sorry, the, so if you instantiate that over uh, number fields, basically, uh, over, sorry, cyclotomic fields, basically uh, you can reach uh, a reduction which is in O soft N square B, where N is a degree of your cyclotomic field. Um, this is also heuristic. We need some heuristic to control uh, the size of the uh, lifted elements. So we can't get rid of that uh, directly. And there is a small trick here. We don't have the exact same approximation of LLL, but we have something which is slightly worse, which is an O soft N. Okay, so we are faster than LLL, but the approximation faster is a bit worse. Okay, this is a trade off. And last but not least, and I will uh, conclude with that, um, we, can you, we can go even faster using some uh, geometric structure on the field. So uh, what is this? Uh, basically, I'm just going to draw a small table which is going to give you the differences between a Euclidean space and a symplectic space. A Euclidean space is basically the space we are living in, like F3, whatever, and the symplectic space is the space where the, let's say, physicists are living, because this is something from physics. Um, so you take your real vector space and you uh, endow it with some symmetric bilinear form, an inner product, non-degenerate for, for this reason, but so okay, this is the usual way of measuring angles. And what you do for getting a symplectic space, you do the same, but you are adding four letters, four letters, like anti-symmetry. <laughs> okay, this is the end. Now basically, um, so this small difference will make uh, everything nice. So you look at all the linear transformation which are acting on your space and you take only the one which are preserving the inner product. So this is the definition of the orthogonal group. Okay, um, so, you can do exactly the same. You can take the uh, space, or the space, or the, the group of linear transformation which are preserving the symplectic form. This will give you the symplectic space. It's exactly the pendant of it. Okay. 
And this orthogonal group also is very nice. Why? Because from any basis, you can transform with the Gram-Schmidt organization process your basis into an orthogonal one. And this means that the uh, Gram matrix of this basis will have this shape. Gram matrix is the matrix of the pairwise inner products. So for an orthogonal basis, basically, the, uh, you are orthogonal to every other vectors, explaining the zeros. And the norm of each element in an orthogonal basis is one. So the matrix is an identity. And for simplectic spaces, you have something also nice, which is called a Darboux basis. And it can be computed exactly in the same way as the, you compute the orthogonal basis. But instead of having the identity, you will find something which is called a Darboux base, which is a block matrix with minus identity and identity in the reverse order. Okay. So this means something. On the one hand, a simplectic space may be of even dimension. Okay. First remark, because you have D in D here, so dimension is 2D. Second remark is that you have some interaction between first vector and the corresponding last vectors. So you have pairwise like interaction. And how are we can going to use that? So if we want to do the reduction, let's say, of uh, some lattice here, this is just elements, elements, I'm reasoning in an abstract way. So if I want to uh, reduce it in the Euclidean case, I'm going to uh, so look at the first vector, okay, and then reduce, you reduce the second vector using the first one. Okay, this is the first step of the LLL reduction. In the simplectic case, I will do the same. I will, use the I will reduce the second vector using the first one. But since I told you that because of this very specific structure, uh, I have an interaction between this vector and these vectors, what will happen is that from the reduction of that vector, I can get this one for free. Then I will pursue. So in the Euclidean case, I will need to reduce the third vector using the two first. In the simplectic case, I will need to reduce the third vector using the two first, but Hack, I will get this one for free. Then I pursue, I pursue, I pursue, and I will reach the middle of the basis. So here, I have reduced this part of the basis. I also have reduced this part of the basis in the simplectic case, but using simplectic symmetries, I also get that one for free. So I decrease the number of operations by something okay, a bit less than two. Okay. And so now, how we can we plug that in this recursive strategy over the number field. So the first thing is, okay, I said I have, a, I have a symplectic form which helps me to do the reduction. So I need to find the symplectic form here. I need to find the symmetries. So I will just use a very, uh, let's say, canonical uh, symplectic form, which is the determinant form, which is basically the generalization of just the area between two vectors. This is a determinant. This is a symplectic form. This gives you symmetries over there. Okay, I'm taking that. Then what I'm going to do is uh, trying to have the same structure on the subfield. Uh, so I will need to define a new symplectic form which has the same properties as the form above. And how I can do that? I can do that, I can do that by finding a suitable, a suitable linear form, T, and compose it with my form. And I do that at each step so that when I will reduce recursively in the field, I will still have at each level uh, some symplectic form to exploit. And so what we want is to uh, have a compatibility. This is why when I say suitable, if I take uh, rank two module over the upper field, I want that this descent over the subfield here, which is of size two of uh, rank two R, is also symplectic for the form I found here. So at each step, basically, I will, I will have for free a symplectic structure that will halve the number of, of um, operation I have to do. Since the tower here is not trivial, I will gain two at each level, and so I will have something in two to the, uh, two to the height improvement. Okay. And so if you look at what it's uh, giving more precisely, then for cyclotomic field, we can have something uh, which is in O soft of n square minus something. This something is over here. If you implement that for very large uh, bit size uh, over cyclotomic power of two, you find something here, which, which is in uh, n to the uh, log three, which is lower than n squared. And we still retrieve something with approximation factor slightly uh, worse than the <coughs> regular LLM. So everything uh, has been fully implemented, and so we made uh, sort of full testing on that. So here are some uh, practical results from the uh, implementation of this, all of these techniques, actually. 
So for knapsack-like uh, algorithm, we're able to uh, reduce uh, so kind of all FHT instances uh, of dimension like 2,000 in something like 30 hours. Um, we estimated the cost of uh, what could take FPLLL for uh, this kind of uh, this kind of elements. It's something it would take like something like 2,000 years. Uh, and then from the structure part, so using like this uh, recursive structure over number fields, basically we're able to uh, reduce GGH light uh, 200 something, uh, 244 um, uh, lattices with a uh, few thousand of bits in something like four days, uh, which would have taken something like uh, a lot of time using FPL. Yeah. This is all clock time or uh, CPU time? Work this is work time. Clock time. Uh, and yeah, so the platform used was something what uh, 128 cores with one terabyte of RAM, and all of this, uh, all of this implementation is public. Uh, even though it's still a proof of concept, so maybe uh, you will have some uh, slight trouble when using it. I don't know, but we will be happy to help if you want to install it. Uh, and please uh, make sure that you have a nice way of cooling your CPU because it's kind of heavy computation. Um, Could it be good enough to break something then? For specific instances, yeah. For like this FHC example, it's in, in, on, in fact the security parameters of this FHC paper were stating LLL-like algorithm breaks the stuff and they are doing their, uh, their parameters like that. Of, of course, it's not, I mean, it's not big easy poor. I mean, you, you yeah, yeah, yeah. M maybe, uh, maybe a word on that <laughs> since you're asking, yeah. Uh, this is exponential approximation factor. This is absolutely not something which is big easy like, uh, just, just to be, to for, for some specific example, yeah. So maybe a bit, yeah, for the one minute left, I just speak a bit on like open direction and open problems uh, that are here. Yeah. Um, so I said that we are using simplistic structure to uh, decrease the complexity and, but it increases the approximation factor at the same time. What we could do is try to use, to use more general uh, geometric structure, not simplistic uh, forms, but higher order simplistic forms. So we have kind of technical issues and still in working, but not going to extend on that. And I said that there were a lot of heuristics. Uh, so I said, yeah, we need to control the precision, we need to control the lift part. Everything needs heuristics. Um, so having a proved, a fully proved algorithm, even if it's slower, would be very interesting, at least from a theoretical point of view. And a way to do that would be to not reduce free modules, but projective modules. And which means that we are not reducing uh, copies of the ring of integer, but we are reducing modules which are some copies of fractional ideals. Okay. And the idea to do that would be to now extend our lifting, so these things that take your small vector in a subfield to the upper field, and we need to extend that to ideals, so we can use like techniques uh, inspired by uh, Cohen. Uh, but now you would, look, you would need not to compute with vectors, but to compute with ideals at every step. And this is costly, actually. And this would become the bottleneck of the algorithm. And in fact, what we could have is to uh, so you, since you can see your ideals as lattices, ideal lattices uh, we can use the reduction algorithm we are constructing to reduce ideals and to have a nice way to multiply them uh, an efficient way using, uh, rec using reduction algorithm. And from that, you would have two cross, two cross recursive algorithm. One is the reduction algorithm here. One is the uh, fast multiplication uh, of ideals. And then the reduction would say, hey, please, Multiply me this ideal, so we say, okay, but please reduce me this lattice, and then this is a cross reduction at any point. So as a byproduct of having a proved way of reducing projective lattices, then we also have a neat way of multiplying ideals in number fields. Thank you very much for your attention. question is motivated by um, the continuous hidden subgroup problem in which uh, for, for uh, solving principal ideas uh, problem quantumly and uh, if we apply this to a billion number field uh, then we need to run LLL on a ZG lattice to quantumly. What do you mean to a billion number field? Ah, you, you have a lot of no different number fields, that's what you mean? Abelian. Ah, Abelian, I billion. okay, Abelian tricky, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so, so, so. In that case, the, the lattices, uh, the logarithmic lattices that you're dealing with are ZG modules. So the question is... Uh, we need to reduce them quantumly, which is supposedly very expensive. Do you think you could generalize your algorithm to ZG lattice and not just uh, 
you can still have an exploitation of the structure depending on the G you get, of course. Uh, the point is, do you have a quantum, can you construct a quantum algorithm This is beating uh, the like classical thing and don't really know. Uh, yeah, it's the same, it's kind of the basically the same as the regular one, I would say. Okay, no, the, I'm cheating a bit, but it's kind of. Uh, but so, so you don't really need the, <coughs> you don't really need that your orders are integrals here. You could deal with orders. Yeah, that are yeah, yeah, yeah. With rings that are. Yeah, yeah, which are not. Uh, but I'm not sure, I mean, since you are working in a quantum setting, I'm not sure if this is really, I mean, if you will gain a lot from that. Uh, this is for the deterministic part, at least. Oh, yeah, okay, 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 sorry, I, I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah that might be interesting to look at. Uh. Yeah, this is uh, very nice. <coughs> Any more questions?